Another one of my favorite songs. <laughs> um, it's in your program, Shine, Jesus, Shine. You have the words in there. <coughs>
this is a quiet one. <laughs>
another favorite. When the roll is called up yonder, 216. <clears throat> one more time and let's all stand up. Darla was trying to get you to stand up and nobody did anything. <laughs> Don't you feel like camp meeting? Okay, be seated. I was sitting there in my mind, I was reminiscing back on the old camp meeting days in Mount Vernon. And I was just wondering, I was looking over the audience here and I was wondering, who is who would be considered the alumni of the camp meetings from the 60s and 70s? Mount Vernon, yes. And it wasn't air conditioned. We had those wooden chairs and you sweat and you would stick to them. And about half the people came back after the morning service just like today. <laughs> but those were good times. Then they had to go and air condition the building. Well, I'm glad that you all stayed around for this afternoon, and I'm excited to hear more about the book of Psalms from Peter. But before we do that, I actually want to recognize someone in the group here today. And, you know, as soon as you start recognizing one person, you might get in trouble. There might be somebody else that fits into this category. But there's a gentleman over here. I don't know if you saw, if, you've, if you met Claire Whitford. He was very obvious because his tie says Purple Heart. So I asked him about that. Claire, would you stand up so we can recognize you? It's what, 70 years ago in Korea? Yeah, 64. 64 years ago in Korea. Tell us what happened.
Thank you for sharing. Okay, well, before we get to Peter, I'm going to say one more time, we do, Lonnie gave me some more tickets. If you're wanting to go to the Love Me Musical week from Sunday, there are still seats available in 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock performances, let me know. So without any more from me, Peter, come back up here and share some more with us from the beautiful book of Psalms. Thank you again, Jerry and choir and the beautiful voices. I mean, the talent in this choir is awesome. There are many churches that would do incredible things just to have a tenth of you, um, and that's a lot. Uh, you, know, you think about camp meeting, the difference that you make in camp meeting. Sitting in, the, in that auditorium, although I didn't get to sit there, I got to work with juniors in the, um, I don't know where it was, the chapel, I guess. And you wonder what you do with juniors, but we just made it fun. One year, um, we had built a submarine, and we called it the Gospel Submarine. And the kids, we had periscopes and things like that, and I adapted the Beatles song, Yellow Submarine, to be, we all live in the Gospel Submarine. <laughs> and the kids loved, you know, when it got to the chorus, they go, oh yeah, and uh-huh, they loved it. It was fun. And... Um, Years later, Kathy and I, when we were pastoring at Sligo, uh, were, had driven out west um, to speak at a church in Durango? No, Pagosa Springs. And Sabbath was over and, and friends said, why don't you go and try some of these hot springs on the, on the mountainside? Well, we'd never done that. And it's kind of fun. You can dial in the hot spring you sit in. The very first one is like really hot, but then they have little things they add to it so that this is not so hot, and that's the bottom one's really pretty, pretty tame. So we tried one that was hot, and we thought, no, this isn't any good. So we looked down, there were three people in the spring down below, so we said, let's go try that. So we went down, and we're sitting in it, and it's just kind of funny how you dial into people of certain faith traditions. We're sitting in this thing, it's about 10 o'clock at night, and I'm chatting up, and I said, two gentlemen and a lady, and I said, so, who are you, where are you from? Well, she was a physical therapist, like Kathy, and he was a minister, and he was a school teacher. I said, well, where do you teach? Oh, it's a parochial school. I said, so what's the name of the Adventist school you teach at? He said, how did you know? <laughs> we chat, and we're talking, and where are you from? Well, I'm, we're from Ohio. Well, so are we. Did you ever go to camp meeting? Yeah. And we talked about camp meeting, and he said, did you do the Gospel Submarine song? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, every time that song's on the radio, it's the Gospel Submarine, not the Yellow Submarine for me. So it's funny how those things stick and, and, and stay with you. And what a wonderful place for memories that are made. Well, as we go now and we take a look, we're not going to do Psalm 19, as glorious as that is. Jerry, I think of you every time I read this. The heavens declare the glory. Wasn't that a big... Poster. It's a poster, yeah. Remarkable, remarkable testimony. Psalm 19 is in three sections. The general revelation of nature and what we see in the heavens. The special revelation of God's law given to the people through Moses. And then the personal revelation of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Well, what the heck, let's do it quickly. So the heavens... Um, in the first section, and then the law, and then the personal revelation. So let me, well, let me just, let's just see if we can read through this, if we've got it. Here, here's how the chiasm sets up. The testimony of the heaven glorifies God. Let my testimony glorify you, O Lord. The witness of the heavens is obvious to all and cannot be heaven, hidden. My witness is in keeping your word, and the central thesis is the section that speaks about the law of the Lord is perfect. Let's read it. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone throughout the earth, their words to the end of the world. 
In them he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of the chamber and rejoices as a strong man running its race. It rises from one end of heaven to the other in its circuit to the end. There is nothing hidden from its heat. The first six verses describe the order of the universe. The faithfulness of Mr. Sun showing up. He's never been late for work once. The f incredible intricacies of the stars as they move in their diamondiferous orbits. It's all in order. We sing about it. We speak about it. And its glory is evident to all. There's not one alive who has not seen that. That's general revelation. Paul speaks about it in Romans. The truth about God is known, plainly known, all can see. We see that general revelation. But general revelation gives us a bit of a confusing message. Because while you can see the beauty of some things, you also see the ugliness of others. You see a you know, beautiful fish, and then a bigger one comes and eats it. You know, I mean, that, that, so what, what's, what's going on in this thing? Is it, is it just about beauty? What is the order? Then the special revelation, the law of the Lord, and it goes this way, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. We sing this. The statutes are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. The judgments of the Lord are true. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. So the law of the Lord, what is the law of the Lord? Skill testing question. Who's going to be the lucky one who makes eye contact with the preacher? Oh, my, yes, Elizabeth. Grace, what is the law of the Lord? That is, Jesus gave two commandments. The law of the Lord is summed up, love the Lord and love others. The law of the Lord understood in the Old Testament and understood throughout scriptures, Jesus spoke of it, is the Pentateuch, the first five books. That is the Torah. That is the revelation of God's grace. In there you find. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. In there you find the instructions about how to plant a vineyard. In there you find the instructions that are the basis of our civil law today. You find the health law. You find the liturgical teachings of sacrifice. You find grace, not works. You confess your sins on the head of a lamb and its life is taken in your place. In there you find about the first surgical um, incursion. So, Dr. Sickler, what's the first surgery other than God whipping out Adam's, e, uh, Adam's rib? What's the first surgery? Yeah, you do, because you're a guy. Circumcision. That's a surgical procedure. The Bible says you shall circumcise the male babies on the eighth day. Everything else is sevens or threes or fours, why eight? When babies are born today, we give them a shot of vitamin K. Why? What's it do, Darla? It's the clotting factor. So you don't get umbilical bleeds. If the child needs surgery, they can withstand the surgery right away. They didn't have vitamin K in those days, did they? But they had something better. They had the Torah. It said eight days. The physiological development of a newborn is that upon birth their K factor, clotting factor, is low. But on or about the eighth day, it naturally grows to a level where surgery can be withstood. Who's going to know that but your manufacturer? Mrs. Toyota tells us how to look after the car because she made it. God tells us how to look after ourselves because he made us. This is not a book of cleverly devised myths or fables. There's wisdom here, and the law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. It converts the soul. It makes wise the simple. It brings rejoicing to our hearts. And then the last section of this psalm is, it says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back your servant from his presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me then I will be blameless and I'll be innocent. 
So there's the general revelation that we all see, the special revelation that God shares in his word, but then there's the personal revelation. I don't know if I told you this last night, it was somewhere I was talking about. Brother Andrews, the Bible smuggler, we had him come to Kettering many, many years ago. And he talked about the separation, the difference between heaven and hell. And he asked me to stand up, and I stood up. And he said, how tall are you? I told him, he said, well, heaven and hell are separated by 18 inches. Looks like there's a lot of heaven and a lot of hell in you. And sadly, some of my church members said, amen. <laughs> and heaven and hell are separated by the distance between here and here. It's knowing, but then it's experiencing and trusting. We can know there is a, there's a great master designer. We can read and understand his principles. But he said, Lord, help it go from here to here. Cleanse my heart. Let it move into my life that I'm personally aware, that personal revelation that makes me live and love and serve. That's Psalm 19. It's a powerful psalm. Go and look at this. I don't know if tonight will be clear or not, but go and look at the stars and just wonder and be in awe again. All right. We're not going to do Psalm 8. I want to move here to... We're not going to do the Psalms of Ascent either. Um, okay. Psalm 73. Guy who wanted to give up. Because this section is entitled Being Real with the Father. Psalm 73, if you'll take your Bibles, we'll go and read this together. Psalm 73 is the um, first psalm in the third book. So that means that it's dated about what? First book is 1,000, second book is 800, third book is 500 B.C. It's a psalm of Asaph. And Asaph brings to us a perspective of eternity. I'm going to go through here. Um, it, it talks about the prologue, first three verses, then the bodies talking about the problem, and then the answers, the first answer, the second answer, and finally the conclusion. So we're going to take a look at this one. Let me, let, let me read this to you, if you've, if you've got your Bibles, or just listen, I didn't put it up on the text. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Got the problem? Got the situation? God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, but I almost blew it. I almost slipped, because I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death. Their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men are. They're not plagued like others. Therefore, pride serves their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out with abundance. They have more than the heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly and concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people return. Waters of full cup are drained by them. They say, how does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Get the picture? People who don't know God are doing just fine, thank you very much. In fact, they're doing better than fine. They're doing better than I am. And he's envious. Verse 13 is the core of the problem. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Ba basic premise is, what's the point of being faithful? What's the point of following what my faith invites me to do, whether it's dietary or whether it's uh, worship or ritual or, or, or tithing or anything like that? What's the point? Not getting me anywhere. Okay? Verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thusly, behold, I would have been untrue to the generations of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. So he's struggling. 
How many of you have ever been there? This is life. We've all been there. What's the point? I try this and bang, that happens. What's going on, God? Job was there. Everyone who's aware of their walk with God is at this point at some time or another. What's this about, Lord? It was too painful me until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction and how they're brought to desolation. In a moment, they're utterly consumed. As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you will despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is none on earth that I desire besides you. My, heart is fle my flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Get the dynamic? Why? Two, two answers. The first answer happens when he goes into the sanctuary. What's he see in the sanctuary? What's going on there? Yeah, you've got the whole sacrificial system. And you see in the, in the annual cycle of services, you've got the daily sacrifice um, that, that is done for the nation. You've got the individual sacrifice that comes as people confess their sins. You've got then the festivals. You've got the, 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 the wave sheaf and you've got the new year and you've got then atonement where the sin of the nation is carried and dealt with symbolically once and for all. There is an ultimate end and that's what he hadn't seen. See, this is a psalm that gives us perspective. It kind of reorients. It's kind of like what I love to do to my computer. Control, Alt, Delete. I love those three keys. They almost make me deal with caps lock that I always stick on. But it's rebooting our way of looking at life. So much comes inward. Sometimes all I see is what's in front of me. And he says, no, no, step back. Look at the larger perspective. Look at the heavens as, as, as David invites us in Psalm 19. Get the bigger picture. There is an absolute picture here. And he recognizes they're on the slippery slope. My feet had almost slipped, but they're on the slippery slope. But then he goes and answers and reflects a second time. That if I had considered this, I would have been unfaithful to you, Lord, and to your acts of grace throughout time, to your blessing and to your guidance and to your deliverance of people in the midst of their struggles, in the midst of their wandering. Look how long God suffered with Israel. What a bunch of difficult people. But you know, when I say that, I look in the mirror and I figure I've been a difficult person too. God is patient and kind. And the psalmist comes to this insight that it's not all about me. It's about him and his character and his grace. But what I celebrate about this psalm is that he's honest. I'm jealous. I'm going to give up. What's the point? I'd much rather the person who talks about it than the person who just walks out and disappears and never comes back. You know, they're walkers and talkers. Walkers are people who will leave never to return. Talkers are those who tell you why. They're people you can reach. Walkers, you never have a chance to reach. This guy's a talker. And he's telling us and inviting us to equally to talk and to share about those struggles that we personally deal with in our journey. And he resolves that and presents that in a way that speaks about it. Once again, the metaphors and the images of you hold me by my right hand. Who do I have but you? This is the God who does not leave us or forsake us. 
The next psalm is uh, Psalm 137. And this is what we call an imprecatory psalm. This is a psalm you, you'll, well, you'll see when we read it. This comes in the, in the fifth book when Israel had been taken into captivity, remember? Hauled off by the, first of all, Israel was taken by the Syrians. This is Judah, taken by the Babylonians. And this is their lament, written by the Euphrates River. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. Those who plundered us requested mirth. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I don't remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the days of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rocks. We have no idea the horrors that existed and they went through. When Assyria took Israel into captivity, they would have bronze hooks that they would put through the jaws of their captives and march them. This, this, there, there was no sense of civility in any way, barbaric and horrific. And, and we can only imagine, Claire, what you saw in war, these people felt. But this psalm particularly describes the journey of those who are now in a foreign land. And the question asked in verse 4 is the very question Raj raised in Sabbath school. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We haven't moved as much as culture has moved around us. How do we sing the Lord's song in this community? How do we sing the Lord's song in our places of work? How do we sing it in our, our neighborhoods? How do we sing the Lord's song so that it's not just us singing solo, but we got a choir like you got here? How do we sing the Lord's song downtown? We're working with the people of Africa, the Rwandan refugees. 160 people worshiping in the Grandview Church, the Christian Scientist Church that's on our property there. They don't speak English. And, and you want to know what it's like to be a refugee here in the land of promise? In many ways, it's hell. I've had them say, if I'd known this, I would have stayed. The struggle of learning a language, of learning how to conform with the immigration naturalization services, when you have to turn a form in and what it means when they close school and how to talk to a doctor and how to get your kids, it's absolutely difficult and they're struggling just to survive, let alone sing the Lord's song. But there are brothers and sisters and they're just up the road. What are we doing about that? They need someone. And they don't need help as much as they need mentors. People who can say, hey, let me talk to you about what it's like when you go on the streets. Be careful with your children. There are people looking to, you know, all the different things that are out there. They need people that they can call and say, what do I do about this? But in the business of our life, sometimes that's a challenge. So here the people of Israel are in Babylon. What a horrific thing to say. Sing me. It's kind of like being a captive in war. Right, sing me your national anthem now. How happy are you about that? Where is your God if he lets you become captive? And so they speak of their fidelity to Jerusalem. Let me never forget. And then the difficult part is they're asking God to remember Edom and to act against them those who raised Jerusalem to the ground, and daughter of Babylon that will be destroyed. 
May there be joy in those who torment you as you have tormented us. Doesn't sound very, very, very nice, does it? Kind of like an eye for an eye, tit for tat. But remember, all the words of Scripture are not words that we find ourselves saying, that's the best thing I could do, is to be thankful that the people are going to do unto you what they did unto me. No! This is in the context of their pain and sorrow, and it's God's judgment coming to Babylon. And they're saying, Lord, may that be the way, because that's how we're feeling right now. Some of these psalms are challenges that we try to sort out and, and work through. We're going to go take a look at another one now. Psalm 55, I think, is the psalm we're going to look at. And this goes a little deeper because this gets a little more personal. I think that's the one we're going to look at. Oh, Psalm 69. We're not going to do that one. There we go, 55. Psalm 55 is a psalm about how life in the congregation can get messy. Hmm. Let me, um, and I don't think I copied it. No, I didn't. So let me, let me read this to you. It's a psalm to the chief musician with stringed instruments. It's a contemplation of David, a masquil. David reads the following. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and don't hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me, for I am restless in my complaint, and I moan noisily. Because of the voice of the enemy, the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble on me, and wrath they hate me. What's David feeling? Good, bad, or indifferent? He's upset, and he's saying, God, I need your ear right now. My heart is severely pained within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. What's he wanting to do? What's he, get away. Have you ever wished, when you're in the middle of a crisis or a difficult time, that you're on a Star Trek set and you said, Scotty, beam me up. Just get me out of here. That's a very natural prayer that we all have. I wish I wasn't here. I wish it would go away. It's not going away. So look what David does. Verse 9, he says, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go around on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are in the midst of it. Destruction is in the midst of oppression and deceit. Don't depart from its streets. This is a difficult, bad town. There are difficult, bad people here. Verse 12, for it's not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted itself against me. Then I could hide from him. No, it's you. A man, my equal, my companion and my acquaintance, we took sweet counsel together and walked in the house of God in the, in the throng. So if it was an enemy, that's what enemies do. If it was an adversary, that's what adversaries do. But no, it's you. We're in church together. We're worshiping together. And you're the one who has turned or something has happened here. So David says, and he gets rather straight here. It's, it's, it's a little horrific. He says, let death seize them, let them go down alive to hell, for wickedness is their dwellings and among them. As for me, I call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I'll pray and cry aloud and he'll hear my voice. He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there are many against me. God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from old, because they do not change, therefore they don't fear God. He has put forth his hand against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. Now he's talking about his, his, his church member, his, his fellow member. War was in his heart, so words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord and he'll sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. 
So what does David do here? I really like that image of let them go down to hell alive. I mean, have you ever been that angry with someone? Oh, come on. In Washington, Sligo, those were some difficult days, let me tell you. And what made it even more challenging was the fact that in our neighborhood, we were renting a home. We had all of our goods stored in our one-car garage. They had taken down an old barn. And when the barn came down, the rats came out. These are big Norwegian rats. And I got 16 of them. You don't use the little mouse traps, you use great big things. And one day I was in and I decided to go through the garage and just see how things were and I saw a box that was moving. It was the box in which Catherine had stored the smocked dresses that she'd made for the girls for their first day of school. And I thought, this is not going to be good. So I got the box out and it was a big rat. At the time, I was really dealing with some difficult people. So I got a shovel and I chased the rat. And I did more than that. I named the rat. <laughs> and every time I brought my shovel down, I missed the rat. And that made me more frustrated. And then the voice said, and I'm telling you, it was a voice, said, hit in front of the rat. I hit in front of the rat, and that rat died. But I named it. Isn't that sick? I have friends who go out to the driving range once a week. They write names on the golf balls. Bam! They hit them. Now, some of you who are given to psychological insight will just diagnose that and, and talk about it. Catharsis is a thing that we need to do. Some people do it with the person that they're upset with. David takes it to the Lord. He takes it to the Lord and he says, this is what I wish. This is how I'm feeling. Because these people act this way. They are far from you and from what I see. And God, you will be faithful. If we cast our burden on you, you will sustain us. So here's my burden. Take it, Lord. So after I had my little rat naming escapade, I had given that all to the Lord. Then about nine years later, I got a letter. And somebody said, you know, I was really, really rough during your years here. I want you to know how much I appreciate not only what you did, but how sore I am for how I behaved. And I couldn't resurrect the rat. It was already gone. But <laughs> when you give it to the Lord and let it go, that's the big thing, because the big issue here is about forgiveness. And we've all been wronged, haven't we? We've all been slighted. We've all been hurt, some more deeper than others. And we carry that in our hearts. And that anger and that sense of, you know who they are. I mean, you just have to think about, bam, you've, your body tenses up. Who's really in jail here? If you were to go and ask the people what it was they did, do you remember doing this to me? I bet you 50% of them haven't got a clue they even did it. And probably 50% of those who do would say, oh, I'm so sorry, that was an innocent, silly mistake, and yet we assign motive and intent and all of that, and we get spooled up. Jesus said, Father, Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, they knew what they were doing. They were driving nails and spears and beating and whipping, but they didn't know what they were doing. And he forgave them. You and I need to forgive and let it go. Let it go. Write a letter to them saying, this was on my heart. And I just want you to know that I've dealt with it. I've let it go. We don't have to ask forgiveness of each other to be forgiven. Isn't that the amazing thing? We all stand forgiven in Christ. 
when we appropriate the grace by confessing to him. But to forgive each other and to let it go lets you out of jail. Otherwise, you're sitting in there, you're crossing the street so you don't look at them, you're ignoring phone calls, you don't want to hear them. That's, that's grade three. That's grade three school ground, kindergarten, whatever. Kathy says, that's so grade three. You, that's, she has levels of my behavior. And <laughs> sometimes I'm grade three. But it is. When we react out of our natural self, and I have to confess to Pastor Vince, where's Vince? So your sheep may be smart. Now, he gave me the, the newsletter he sent you all. But when we're all left to our natural self, we go astray. We go astray. It's only in the Lord that we can find that wisdom. And he says, forgive. Let it go. Move on. Because this will happen. And particularly in a community of faith, we'll find that. We'll mess it up. But David did the right thing. He wrote about it. He took it out of his heart and he put it on paper. And then he gave it to God. With a few suggestions of what God might do, but that's okay. <laughs> He knows that God is God and he trusts him. Now, the interesting thing is that um, Psalm 55 was something they sang in church. Wow. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could sing in church about the error of our ways? Not just a nice song, but a story song. You know, so, so Vince comes in next week and he sings a song. He sings, you know, the Vince Wallen blues, you know. And, and, and he confesses. But he talks about God's grace. If we were to be that transparent and recognize that we all walk the same streets of life and deal with the same issues, wouldn't there be a sense of fellowship and support? There'd be a sense of togetherness because we're bonded by our common humanity. Don, you talked about it this morning. It's about love, it's about fear, it's about hope, it's about anger, it's about loneliness and abandonment, it's about aspiration, it's about guilt. Man, if we could just acknowledge that, we'd stop pretending. And we could then really experience even more so the reality of God's grace in our lives. So Psalm 50, 55 has... Um, this chiastic structure and centers on the betrayal of the trusted friend. That's in the first half. The second half comes to recognizing that he that is thrown, enthroned of old, God will hear, God will humble them. Such have no changes and fear not God. And that is that psalm. So again, the chiastic structure that highlights it. Do I expect you to find the chiasms? Yes, you can find them. It just sit, sit with the word and look at the themes and look at the, look at the images, look at the, 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 the concept, summarize it in one word and begin to see parallels. But it becomes quite evident what is the prominent point of that psalm. I told you last night that the Sermon on the Mount is a chiasm, beginning and end. And the pinnacle of that chiasm is the Lord's Prayer. So they wrote with intent, with purpose, that we might get the right message. They put the emphasis on the right syllable. We really got the point, and it stood out. Psalm 42, well, I, I, I want to be faithful to time. Was it 4 o'clock, Vince, that we were winding up? Where is Vince? There you are. Or 5? Wind up if you want. Okay. I've shared Psalm 42 and 43 in a number of settings, and I don't want to go over plowed ground with you. Um, is it familiar to you? Yes? No? We sang it just a moment ago. It's a psalm about the sons of Korah. And the sons of Korah were worship leaders. And this is a psalm, it's one psalm, not two. 42 and 43 are the same psalm joined by the same chorus. 42 verse 5, 43 verse 11, sorry, 42, 5, 42, 11, and 43 verse 5. Like blessed assurance, this is my story, this is my song. 
you find that. This is the same psalm. So somebody blew it when they divided them up. That's all right. It's a psalm written by the worship leaders in the temple. These are the people who were the ones responsible for the experience of worship, that celebration. My brothers and sisters coming from the Pentecostal church, experience and worship and energy was a big part of worship, wasn't it? We need a little bit more here in, in, in our experience to, to find that, to, to really help that connection, but we need that balance, and it's a powerful thing. You cannot have worship that is boring. You've got to have worship that is engaging. And when I say here, I mean on planet Earth, not, on, not, not, not in Hamilton. You've got wonderful worship here. But the psalm tells the story that the sons of Korah wrote how they got lost in church. Okay? Remember the TV show Lost in Space? Well, I can understand how you can get lost in space. But how do you get lost in the very place you're supposed to be found? Huh? I mean, give it to me. Adam and Eve sinned. What was the first thing God said to them? Where are you? Where are you? And he wasn't asking a geographic question. He was asking a spiritual question. Where are you? Are you in my heart? Or have you stepped outside and gone away? He knew perfectly well where they were. So the sons of Korah were the gatekeepers. And you can find that. Just Google Korah and you'll find all of this stuff. But go back and look in the, in the concordance and you'll see how that works out. How they show up. So it is a psalm that talks about the journey. Do you have, um, well, I don't think I put this in on the text. Nope, that's it, okay. So let me read Psalm 42 and 43 to you. 42 um, begins the first book of, of uh, first of uh, book two. And so it's that t uh, contemplation. As the deer pants for the water, so longs my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Not the God of my fathers, but the God who knows my name today. He knows me. He calls me Karen. He doesn't call me so-and-so's granddaughter, because God doesn't have grandchildren. He calls us by our name. My soul thirsts for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? For tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God? Is this person having a good time or a bad time? Bad time. What's the issue? They can't find God. They don't know how to get that connection. They're crying about it. They're struggling. My soul thirsts and craves that presence of God. Verse 4, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. With a voice of joy and praise, we were a multitude that kept the pilgrim feast. I was there. I led them. And now I can't find him. Verse 5 is the beginning of the chorus. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So you get the dynamic? Something's happened, and he's drifted. He's wandered. And he can't find his way back. Verse 6, oh my God, my soul is cast down. Therefore, I will remember you. Now, this is an important thing that you find in Hebraic literature. Remembering is more than just recalling. Remember the Sabbath day? Israel was in, 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 in captivity for 400 years and God remembered his covenant? It wasn't that he'd forgotten it. It wasn't that he needed to recall it. Remembering is acting. I will remember. I will remember and act and engage again with you from the land of J Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from the hills of Mizar. Now, it gets a little confusing in here because it's a little obscure. But what this is basically talking about is that act of creation and what we called last night the theophany, when God is showing up in the act of creation. Maddie, when you get lost, what's the first thing you do other than look at your, your map or your wayfinder, what do you do? 
you're driving down the street and you, you missed something, what, what, what's the first thing you do? Back up to the last place you knew where you were? Yeah. yeah. The familiar, exactly. When you're lost, the first thing you do is go back in your mind to the last place you were found. Where was I when I really knew where I was and I was actually there? And that's what he's doing here. I am lost. So I'm going back and I'm saying, Oh Lord, at the, the, the moment of creation, when the morning stars clap their hands for joy, what was that like? And he goes through the story of creation. He goes through the story of how, how God formed man and woman and how he created those journeys and, and, and the stories of how the great patriarchs unfolded. And he follows that story through through the flood, and he follows the flood through the patriarchs and the patriarchs to Israel and the captivity and the exodus, and pretty soon he begins to recognize where things are. When I get lost, I have a piece of granite from the Canadian Shield, which is some of the oldest rock known to mankind. It's fired rock. It's hard stuff. And that's what I do, because sometimes in the journey of life, I don't know where I am, and I don't know where God wants me to be. And so I get my rock out, and I talk to it. Now, at the end of this weekend, you're going to have enough stuff on me to commit me, but <laughs> I ask the rock, because it was there. What was it like? Because it happened. It's real. And it didn't just pop out of nothingness. What was it? And that gives me a touchstone of reality, where the last place I was found, and I work my way forward, and I walk through the story of salvation, and the story of Scripture. I walk through all those journeys. And in the course of the walk, I recognize there's somebody walking beside me. And he's holding me by my hand. The psalmist got lost. We all get lost. But praise God, he tells us the story. So he goes on as he talks about how the waves and the billows overflow me. Yet the Lord commands his loving kindness in the daytime and at night his song is with me. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning because the presence of my enemies? As with the breaking of my bones, they reproach me while they say, Where is your God? Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? You find often scripture that, that this, this, this interrogative, Where is your God? We don't ask that of each other today, do we? Ron, you had to have surgery. Where is your God? That's not a very nice thing to do, is it? The implication is that if you'd been with God, you wouldn't have had your knee operated on. That doesn't make sense. We don't do that today. We don't need to. Because we have voices in our head that ask us that question all day long without stopping. Oh boy, you blew that. What kind of Christian are you? How much faith do you have if you can't trust God for this? So here's the final confession. Do you have voices in your head that ask you those kinds of questions? Sure you do. You're human. We all do. I can forgive you in a heartbeat. I really struggle with forgiving myself. I can kick myself downstairs and upstairs faster than the blink of a wink. And we don't even have a basement. I don't need you to ask me because I'm always asking myself. And that's the voice that needs the assurance of you are mine. I will not forsake you. I love you. And so he says to them, he says this in, in chapter 43 now, beginning verse 1. He says, so vindicate me, O God. Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Deliver me from myself. Whoa. Didn't see that one coming, did you? But when you read Scripture reflectively, those are things you can do. 
and the Lord will bring that to your mind. You are the God of my strength. Why am I cast off? So verse 3 is the, if you look at the chiasm here, is the key point. Send out your light and your truth and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. And then once again, notice the change in verb tense. Then I will go to the altar of God. To God my exceeding joy and the harp I will praise you. Not unlike what we saw in Psalm 22. I'm struggling. But if you send out your light and your truth, I will be found. And let me, let me close with this. For years in Canada, I, was, I grew up in Lake Ontario, so I would sail. And I lucked out this for three summers. I had a sailboat that I was looking after for somebody who'd gone overseas. And so I got to sail their boat because sailboats need to be sailed. I'd ride down on my bike to the harbor at night after my job on construction, get on the sailboat, and out I'd go. I'd sail as the sun set and the moon rose. I'd sail out there in the autumn and get the, the green aurora borealis. I'd get out there with the stars and crystal, crystal clear nights. But every time you go out, there comes a point where you need to come back. How do you find the harbor on a shore that has got all kinds of lights. Because this was between Hamilton and Toronto. It's like a diamond necklace. The harbor light was red, flashing. Do you know how many flashing red lights there are along Lakeshore Drive? Pick one, anyone. No, you're going to run aground and break the boat up. The harbor light that took me home safely flashed on for two seconds, off for one. On for two, off for one. On for two, off for one. I looked for a light that had that code. On for two, off for one. On for two, off for one. Every time I went to that light, I found safety. We were back to, on, to Oakville many, many years later. Martha was old enough to be cheeky. And she said, because we, we went back to the, to the church where we were married, and Martha said, Let's go down and see if that light's still blinking. You know, you Martha would do that. So we went down, and it was a foggy day, and we got right up to the lighthouse, and we looked up, and you could see the red light going on for two, off for one, on for two, off for one. That is what the psalmist says. I have tried to have myself found. I've tried to do everything I can. Lord, I surrender. Send out your light, your truth, let them find me and bring me to you. And that is that moment of surrender. You heard that song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? Sometimes we do that with God. Be still. Let him find you. He's in the business of finding people. He's in the business of holding our hands and guiding us. In the business of blessing us. So I hope that our time together has given you a little bit of insight to what the Psalms are about and how they're structured. I hope you might enjoy reading them and reflecting on them. Um, Maddie, um, Linda had asked me if there was a book that I might recommend um, on the Psalms, and, and it is. It's a 12-week study on the book of Psalms that might be fun if you want to continue to, to look at that. It's just simply called Psalms, a 12-week study. And the reason I like it is that J.I. Packer is one of the editors, and he is one of the biblical giants in Old Testament studies, and he a um, brilliant man. So if you want a book that would be a study guide uh, or a reflective study, um, Psalms, a 12-week study, and it can be yours for $5.99. Good things aren't always expensive. So enjoy that and blessings upon you. Let me have a word of prayer as we close. Lord, thank you for showing us your heart. The heart of David as he beats with you and walks through life. For all of our hearts are beating. We thank you for those who are courageous to take it to you as an example of how we can live. Thank you for reminding us that we are not alone. That it is your greatest joy to walk by our side and to hold us by our hands. May we place our hands in yours 
and walk with you throughout the days of our lives. We pray in your name. Amen. Would you like to just say amen with me and thank Peter? Amen. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for My being pleasure. here. And, and I promise you that we will not have you committed because we want you to come back. <laughs>